your day-to-day life. So, thank you so much. My name is Megan Wood. I'm one of the co-leads of the Life and Learning Week Initiative. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Thoreau. He's going to be talking about cancer awareness this morning and what you can do uh, in your own day-to-day life, in your own personal life, to make sure you're keeping yourself healthy and happy. Um, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. But if you did not already, I would like you to sign in. We put all those names into the door prizes. That always leads to what are the door prizes. We do have two $50 spa gift certificates. That's our big grand prize at the end of this week. I have some uh, hand-blown pairs of glasses that are beautiful, which uh, we will draw for. And each day of the week, we have a giant gift basket uh, that has been donated by uh, our various vendors. So it takes the games of the day, we put together one giant draw, and then we'll be doing that at the end of the day. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. I'm going to steal my coffee before I go. Okay. Enjoy, guys. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi. I remember most of you from um, from coming here on Wednesday, so it's nice to see you all again. Um, yes? Sorry to interrupt. Before we start writing notes, are we going to get a copy of the slides? If you email me, I will give you a copy of the slides. I can't give you the, this copy I'm using because there are some copyright image, copyrighted images on there that I will be crucified if I use or if I distribute, <laughs> but all the rest of them are fine. So I, um, yeah, no. So give me an email, and I will, um, I will make sure that you guys get all of that. Okay. So um, anyway, just a little bit about me. My name's Paul. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I did my undergraduate degree in biology and cultural anthropology from the University of Calgary, and so you'll you'll probably see that come out in my lecture. I tend to talk about cross cultural health quite a bit because. Um, it's a weird thing about North America. North America is a very odd historical experiment that we have almost an entire continent that speaks one language and has very similar culture. So, you know, you could drive down to Arkansas or to California or to Florida or to the Northwest Territories, and we pretty much understand each other and know what we're doing, which historically is very unique. But um, that gives us a bit of a that gives us a bit of a narrow view about what different cultures do in terms of health and different how different cultures see health. So my anthropological training really helps with that. Um, then in 2006, I went to CCNM, the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto, and got my naturopathic doctorate. Which And I did a lot of extra training in homeopathy, auricular medicine, advanced detoxification, drainage, nutritional med like I did a lot of stuff, um, and so forth. While I was at CCNM, um, I mean, this topic became very dear to me. Uh, my father died of cancer while I was at CCNM. He got diagnosed in my second year and then passed away in my third, uh, which is, you know, re- like, medical school is difficult <laughs> to begin with. And then on top of that, in the middle of your exams, like, finding out your father is having cancer. And then on top of that, you know, in my third year, um, dad didn't tell me he was dying until I got home from, uh, from Christmas vacation. He was dead within 12 days. So um, that was, that really kind of like, whoa, <laughs> that was quite difficult. And um, so it's kind of led to, and it's kind of led to a bit of a, a passion in cancer prevention for me. Um, I don't do a lot of cancer, active cancer treatment. I co-manage cancer patients, certainly with other NDs who um, are more specialized in that. But my thing is preventing cancer, making sure that healthy people do not get cancer later in life. So that's really what I, what, and that's really what I very much enjoy doing in terms of cancer. If any of you have like cancer issues in your own life, I do post cancer patients quite a bit, but not so much the active cancers. Come and talk to me. I know a bunch of people who do. So there's, as a matter of fact, the first naturopathic board specialty recently, uh, maybe three or four years ago, uh, called FABNO. So Fellowship of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology was created. So there are special FABNO people and as well, another a number of people who are a member of the cancer, uh, the Association of Cancer Physicians, uh, Naturopathic Cancer Physicians, may not be exactly what it's called, but it's something like that. So it's quite a love. So there's quite a lot of work going on in this area right now. Most of that, however, is in cancer treatment. Prevention is my big thing. So before we get started, is there anyone? Is there any? Are there any particular questions you guys have that you'd like me to answer my presentation? Like I've got a long presentation here. So if, is, if there's any issues or any questions, please do. I would very much be interested in seeing what you guys want to learn. There are no handouts. I, if you email me, I will send you the PowerPoint without the copyrighted images. Okay? So 
Any other questions you, or any other things about cancer you guys would like to know about? Okay, so that's fine. So I am going to record, I, as you guys see, I am recording this presentation, so it will be up on my YouTube channel. As It usually takes me two or three weeks to get something edited and everything, so it will be up on my YouTube channel. You can Google, or you can um, go on YouTube, and you can say Paul Terrio Naturopathic, because apparently there's a Paul Terrio who's like a sports cat, a soccer broadcaster in Europe who's got a ton of videos as well. So uh, Paul Terrio Naturopathic, and I will come up. And as well, most of my presentations that I've done at AER are here as well. So there's one on diet, and there's a couple of others that I've done um, on toxicity. And um, there's one I'm up going to upload one later today about uh, about retiring well and so forth. So there's a lot of good stuff there. All right. So cancer, or as my dad and his family called it before he actually got cancer, cancer. It's a really scary word, and even saying the word kind of freaks people out a lot of the time. Cancer is technically a disease of cellular proliferation. Cells have a certain environment that they live in, and they have a certain rate of growth which they are supposed to do. Cancer is when that growth rate gets out of control. That's a very, very simple definition of the disease. Recently, um, an allopathic oncologist, so when I say allopathic, I mean you know orthodox medicine, have been deciding, have been suggesting that cancer not be, be reclassified not as one disease, but as several. But even if we look at cancer as a collection of many diseases, that characteristic is quite consistent. Abnormal proliferation of cells. It's classified as either benign or malignant. Benign cancers stay in one place. You've got people, you've heard about people who have benign brain tumors and benign tumors of this and that. That means those cancer cells stay in that one spot and go nowhere else. Or malignant. Malignant means the cancer spread, and the process of spreading is called metastasis. They're usually classified according to their tissue of origin. So you've got, you know, bone cancers, osteo osteos or osteosarcomas. You've got, you know, tissues of uh, cancers of the epithelial glands, like or of the epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissues are membranes, such as you know bowel tumors and you know uh, most kinds of lung cancers. You've got tissues of the blood, and so forth. So. They're basically classified according to their pathological signatures, what they look like under a microscope, and according to their tissues of origin. Very, very recently, uh, they started classifying cancers according to their genetic, like which mutations the cancer in particular has. And when doing that, they discovered that classing, classifying cancers according to their pathology and according to their tissue of origin is really a terrible idea. Different cancers have, or the same cancers, under the, under the pathological system have incredibly different mutations and have very different biochemistries. So it's likely in the future that we're gonna be start having you know, cancers being classified according to their genetic mutations as genetic screening becomes more, uh, more cost efficient and more easily available. Now, that doesn't actually sound that bad. Like you've got you know, cancer, there is proliferation of tissues. What is that, how does that hurt people? And that is actually a surprisingly difficult question to answer. Um, cancer causes damage to the body quite a few ways. First of which is if direct, indirect compression, and that's the most logical. You've got a tumor in your brain. There's only so much space in your skull. The tumor grows. Something else has to give. Very easy. Those kind of cancer, like you know, or there might be cancers that impinge on you know an airway or a nerve or something like that. Those cancers are quite simple to deal with as if they are you know. Benign. You just, it's surgical excision. End of story. Um, but that's not the only way they cause damage. Cancer also causes damage by sucking up resources that the rest of your body needs. Um, cancers often will make decomposition products, particularly, and we'll discuss this later, lactate. So lactate um, or lactic acid uh, has a very toxic effect on your immune system, shuts it right off. So cancer cells will often make a great deal of lactate completely deactivating your immune system, which benefits them, because then the immune system can't, if the immune system is deactivated, the immune system is not killing them. Um, cancers will often release cell signaling molecules inappropriately. Your body has this huge repertoire of tiny little peptides and molecules of various kinds that tell other things in your body to do something. Cancer cells will often secrete these without reason, and that will 
give the rest of your body quite a lot of you know chaos because you know there's all these inappropriate cell signaling molecules happening. Um, another is the immune responses to cancer. Um, this is that if you know I had a cancer patient coming in and they were having you know recurrent fevers and they weren't being, they weren't infections but they were having fevers and so forth and they were feeling really crappy. That would actually be a very good sign because that is a that is a signal that their immune system is doing something. Um, quite often when we experience immune symptoms sim or immune sim <sighs> symptoms indicating an immune response, like fevers, fuzziness, you know, pain and swelling in an area, in this culture we very habitually don't like that. Those are very good things to happen. If I have, a, if I have one of the more consistent things that I've seen in like, patients who develop cancer is that for about 10 years previous they have no fevers. No fevers, no colds, no runny noses, nothing. There are some people who are very healthy who have this. The vast majority of people who never get in any kind of immune response go on to develop very serious pathology later on. So if I'm treating someone who, say they're precancer, or I think they're precancer, and all of a sudden they start developing like bronchitis or they start getting fevers, I'm doing a happy dance. That is an excellent sign. So immune responses to cancer can be very troublesome, but they're usually very good, they're very favorable. I think Hippocrates used to say, give me fever and I can cure any illness. It's very true. Doesn't mean, you know, sometimes it means that there's an infection going on in a cancer patient, which is, which is an entirely different issue, but yeah. You had a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, this, um, say there's like, um, I know someone that has a spot on their lung, Yeah. It's cancerous, and in the last few years she's been getting a lot of like, rashes that nobody it may be, it may we it may well be, but rashes rashes are interesting because rashes can indicate almost anything. So it could theoretically be, but there's a lot of other stuff it could also be. Okay, and so if I if I get quiet or if I start talking too quickly because I sometimes talk too quickly, just give me a wave and tell me to slow down or yell at me or throw something or or, or anything else. And there's of course there are multiple other ways cancer can can harm the body. It, it just depends. So current, currently, lifetime cancer incidence is now 46% in men and 41% in women. This is diagnosed. I, I actually suspect lifetime cancer incidence is about 100% for everyone. It's just in the people who don't get cancer, their immune system gets it before you know anything. Let's say maybe you had a cold or you had a really bad cold one day. Your body may have just fought off a cancer. So I suspect that it's actually much higher. It's simply that our immune systems get rid of it. Um, since 1984, cancers declined a little bit for men, increased a little bit for women. That's probably because of smoking. The overall rate remains extraordinarily stable since cancer stats were beginning to be tracked, which is roughly after, which is roughly with the founding of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States in 1946. So I'm just going to keep track of my time. Put my phone here. Currently, and remember, allopathic is um, allopathic is a term usually refers to the underlying philosophy of, of orthodox medicine. Not all family MDs are very allopathic, but it's it's just a useful useful term to describe that kind of mentality. And as an anthropologist, I like it quite a bit. Many people call it Western medicine. That's a fine that's a fine title as well but it kind of doesn't take into account that there are other Western medicines that don't think this way, like, for instance, homeopathy or naturopathic medicine or others and so forth. So I, I use the term allopathic because I think it's most appropriate. Um, so their treatment, chemotherapy. Lots of ways chemotherapy works. Um, so many that you could, you could do like multiple PhDs on it, so we're not gonna go into that. Um, radiation therapy, surgery. And surgery, literally direct, just removal of a tumor if there's a if there's a particular um, location where it where it's at. Radiation therapy using radioactive um, particles to or ra um, literally radiation to burn out a uh, tumor. Bone marrow transplants. Bone marrow transplants are interesting. Those are used particularly in, in immune cell cancers, and um, so basically they will get rid of your entire immune system, kill the whole thing off then take someone else's immune system, which is usually based in the thymus gland and the bone marrow, but they do bone marrow transplants and transplant it into you. That is, um, 
It's a very interesting procedure, but it can be quite risky just because nobody else's immune system is perfect is a perfect match. You're going to have to you're, you'll have a new immune system, but you have to keep it very suppressed in order to keep your immune system from destroying yourself through autoimmune disease. Um, and what most interestingly, and this has been in the news the last couple of days, there are some vaccines that can treat cancer, probably by um, revving up your own immune system. The very stereotypical example is the BCG vaccine. So BCG is best. Oh, it's Bacille Chemiel, or it's Bacillus Chemiel It's um, a tuberculosis vaccine. That's not. It's not actually that effective for tuberculosis, but they found out that it just works wonders with bladder cancer. So nowadays, when people get bladder cancer, the uh, the standard of care, after chemo and radiation, whatever, is just a BCG shot, and that seems to do very well. Um, there's also some for prostate cancer. So treatment, again, treatment, their overall more, um, length of survival after cancer diagnosis is increased by about 2.6% over the last several decades. Um, that sounds, you know, we've been hearing about how everyone's doing so well. Um, that, and that's taking into account diagnostic time. So when you, so overall treatment or overall time from diagnosis to death is, is quite a bit higher, but that's because of all the emphasis on early diagnosis. Quite often, you know, if you diagnose somebody earlier, it looks like they're living longer, but they're dying at the same point in their pathology. So um, if you factor all that in, treatment time or the time survival time overall for all cancers is about 2.6% longer than it was several decades ago. And that is not evenly distributed. Um, that's counting basically by cancer incidence. Some cancers we've done very well with in terms of allopathic medicine. Uh, the childhood leukemias. Those are, the chemotherapy is very, very effective for those. Things like um, early uh, breast cancer, like ductal carcinoma in C2, very, very effective. Um, again, bladder cancer is another one that's done very well. Um, almost all others, no change. So um, all the, I'm gonna say all the allopathic propaganda about how well we're doing, it's propaganda. We're pretty much where we were in the 70s with those very few cancer exceptions. So, you detected earlier, doesn't make much difference in terms of how it develops. Um, allopathic prevention strategies are overall quite disappointing to me. Um, the biggest one, of course, is smoking reduction. That's kind of like, in terms of history, every so often, like there's historical cycles in allopathic medicine. They go through this therapeutic explosion of all these new drugs and therapies, and then they start weeding back and figuring out what works, and usually it turns out not a lot works. So throughout the, maybe from the 40s to the 70s, we went through the therapeutic explosion, and now we're doing the weed back thing. And whenever the weed back happens, there's this attitude that predominates in allopathic medicine that I like to term therapeutic nihilism. <laughs> Nothing works. And so when therapeutic nihilism takes hold, Usually, the pre preventative medicine takes happen or takes you know a lot of precedent. The last time this happened was in the 19th century, and the and the sort of therapeutic nihilism led to the creation of public health boards and you know our current public health infrastructure and like sewage and water treatment and stuff. So all very good things. This time it's leading into um, obesity reduction, so diet, um, which you know the way they're doing it now, not that great and um, smoking reduction, which is excellent. So smoking reduction, if there's one thing you could do to reduce cancer, cancer risk, it's reduce smoking. Very simple, we all know that. You don't need a naturopathic doctor to tell you that. Um, diet as well, we'll go into diet a little bit. There is an increasing emphasis on getting vaccines to pathogens that cause cancer. The two very fa famous ones are the Hep B vaccine, not the Hep A B vaccine. Hepatitis A doesn't cause liver cancer as much, but the Hep B vaccine and Gardasil for cervical cancer. Those two have their own issues. Um, Gardasil probably dramatically overestimates the number of cervical cancers it can prevent, um, and that's that's not surprising. I mean, it's like most of those stats come from the from the company that makes the vaccine itself, so it's not surprising that they perhaps present their the data they generate in the most favorable light. Um, and hepatitis, you know, that's certainly, that's certainly something to look at. But those are the two big ones right now. Um, the big thing that allopathic medicine has been doing is screening. And when I told you about, you know, 
uh, cancer is being diagnosed earlier and earlier, and so it makes it look like people are surviving longer, but they're just being diagnosed earlier. That's because of screening. Um, the big thing, pap, pap smears, which the, if you get Gardasil, you still need pap smears because it doesn't cover all the, can the cancer-causing uh, strains of human papillomavirus. Um, mammograms. Um, mammograms are being gradually phased out because, um, well, after all the data we've generated over the last couple of decades, turns out they don't actually make a difference in terms of long-term survival, and they do increase the risk of cancer. So, not worth it. They're still used for diagnosis, so if you're doing your monthly breast exams and you find a lump and it's suspicious, they are good for diagnosis, but for screening just a healthy person, they're being gradually phased out. One thing that is actually um, being phased in is breast MRIs. Those work as we thought used to think mammograms did, but they're much more accurate and there's no risk of ionizing radiation. Good luck getting one. Um, you know how difficult it is to get an MRI period in Canada. So especially, and MRI machines are quite expensive, so uh, breast MRI screening may be the gold standard, but it's not gonna happen on a public scale anytime soon, so. So when would they use that one at what point? At uh, what point? Rather than a mammogram. Uh, you would use a breast MRI is better for screening. Mammogram is very good if you're like, is this breast cancer? If you're trying to diagnose it, if you've got good reason to suspect it, breast MRIs tend to be better for screening. They're also very good for diagnosis, but, you know, yeah, so good luck, anyone. <laughs> um, so prostate-specific antigen, again, not terribly great. Prostate-specific antigen is basically an antigen that's found in prostate cells. When the prostate cells are rupturing, as they would be in prostate cancer, it comes out. Um, but the thing is, prostate cells rupture for lots of reasons, so it's not terribly specific. And yeah, so most governments aren't funding it now. I think if people want to do it, they have to pay for it themselves. I think it's like 70 bucks. Um, digital rectal exams for men. So basically, literally, you palpate the prostate and look for hard lumps and so forth. Um, let's see, it's, it's interesting because prostate cancer is, I mean, the prostate is a very interesting organ in that you can feel it. Like most, like, you know, it's not like, you can easily go in there and grab your pancreas or a lung or something or a heart or something like that. Um, so this has led to prostate cancer being one of the most you know, frequently diagnosed cancers. But prostate cancer, unless you get it really early or you have a particularly nasty variety, almost never kills you. People can get prostate cancer and whatever else they've got is gonna kill them first. So it leads me to suspect that cancer, most organs get, can it's a suspicion. I don't, don't have data to back this up. But it leads me to suspect that most organs get cancer as often as the prostate, and it just doesn't bother them. Your immune system keeps it in check, or your immune system eliminates it entirely. So just the prostate being so palpable leads us to overdiagnose and overtreat it. So suspicion of mine. And um, but yeah, no. So in prostate cancer again, if you're going to get cancer and you're a guy, and you have one of the non, you know, very nasty varieties, good cancer to get. And the last being colonoscopy. So colonoscopy. You basically get, um, get put under anesthesia, you get a large camera inserted up your rectum, and they look, and quite often they'll take samples, because the things have little clips, and they take samples and check for pathology. So that's one of the better screening procedures. So that's, that's pretty much it. That's not a lot. And this is, despite, in this, I believe it was the 70s, Richard Nixon, God bless his, God bless him, uh, Watergate aside, he did a lot of good for the United States. Um, he declared war on cancer and committed like billions upon billions of dollars to funding research into it, and which would work out to trillions of dollars today. And um, not a lot's changed. We got a lot of cellular biology out of that that was really useful, and maybe one day that will be useful. But overall, in terms of practical results for patients, not a whole bunch. Yes? Um, that seems... Yeah. Uh, So there are some organisms that infect your body that create an immune response very chronically and long term that leads to cancer. The vaccines are vaccines against those organisms. So it, the theory is, and the theory, and it has been borne out quite well, you get, your body does not get the chronic infective state because it has the antibodies to those organisms, no cancer. Trouble is, not every cancer is caused by an organism. So 
Yes? So you're saying MRI machine equipment is very expensive? Oh, it's very expensive, yes. How expensive is that? What kind of figure is that? Oh, I don't even know. An MRI machine, I'm going to pull a figure completely. The last figure I remember is about 100 grand. And then it's public health. They book up immediately because because MDs really like, I mean, allopathic doctors kind of distrust patient symptoms a lot of the time. So they like like images and lab tests and things. So those machines book up really quickly and mostly with people who don't need them. Um, screening, screening things would book up like, like that. So it would require quite a lot of money to do that. And yeah, you can get private MRIs and I can imagine you can get private breast MRIs as well. Um, I think there's a number of companies in Calgary that offer them. You can get it in like 48 hours. But in terms of like public health. Why well, the public affairs didn't leverage the, the resources in the private sector since it's available there to use it? You'll have to ask Alberta Health Services yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it's the same reason. It's like it's politics and bureaucracy and management and how public health works. Like personally, I think naturopathic doctors should be fully incorporated within Alberta Health Services, and anyone who has anyone who wants to have their health treated that way should be able to. But um, I think that, and statistically, we save you know Medicare a lot of money. But good luck. Can I have a question? Yes, please. So there is a vaccine that given today for I think in grade five. Yeah. Goals. That's Gardasil. Yeah. So would you recommend those? It depends. Like really, it depends on a number of factors. So um, Gardasil, it does not protect against all cervical cancers. You need to get pap smears as frequently as before. It does protect against, it does protect against, um, multiple against it, pro it protects against multiple strains of the virus. The vaccine company says it protects, it will protect against 70% of cervical cancers. They almost always overestimate that. You still need to get pap smears regularly. Um, that's the, I cannot recommend for or against that, but that's the data. So, yeah. Certainly isn't, and there have been some people who have reacted quite negatively to Gardasil. Um, so that's Why kind of it. Why are they even so early? Because they want to get you before you're infected. If they give it while you're infected, well, they don't have as good data on that, so. They want to give it to girls before they're potentially exposed to human papillomavirus, which is why they want to give it before, you know, the sexual debut happens, which is why they usually give it in like late, early junior high. So that's perfectly understandable. Yes? So they're saying a lot of will work small teenagers, so if you pass certain age, it won't work anymore. Is that true? Uh, depends on what it, if you, if you get it after you're a teenager, you may not. You may have been exposed, or you may have a chronic infection, in which case, to, uh, with HPV. So, in which case, it won't work as well, but it still will work a little bit. So, those vaccines are they working? Will they kind of work on um, people that have cancer patients? It depends on which. If you don't, those vaccines work by killing the organisms that cause those two types of cancer. So, if you don't have those organisms, regardless of whether you've had another cancer before, they will work. They don't prevent all cancers. They prevent those specific ones caused by those organisms. So if you don't have infection by those organisms, they will they will reduce that risk for you. Okay? Yes? So screening is really early detection. Yes, that's it. That Diagnose. Theoretically, you can get a cancer. If you can get a cancer earlier, you can you know treat it better. But as we as the statistics show, that's yeah. Yeah. So do you agree with, early, with, with the early detection idea? I agree with the idea. The practice hasn't worked out, but the idea is a lovely idea. Um, I'll explain a little bit about, however, naturopathic doctors and allopathic doctors have a bit different of a philosophy on prevention. With allopathic medicine, you are detecting a disease and treating that disease earlier. With naturopathic medicine, you're focusing on getting the person healthier, which means they won't get the disease. It sounds small, but that's a really big difference. Allopathic medicine, the basic idea of it anthropologically is the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Naturopathic medicine, getting the person healthier. You don't have a disease that you can diagnose earlier in allopathic medicine, like what are you gonna do? 
well, you're going to make them stop smoking and maybe immunize them against those conditions, but like, what are you going to do? Naturopathic medicine, there is a lot you can do to get people healthier. So, different philosophies on that. So I'm not against early screening and so forth, not at all, but we, we need to temper our expectations of it and you know, be aware, like pushing people into mammograms probably created more breast cancers than it caught and probably resulted in the treatment of a number of cancers that, again, were those slow growing types that weren't gonna kill you. So we just need to keep all that data in mind. The big thing with cancer is to get people out of the fear thing with it. Cancer happens to everyone. At some point in your life, you're going to have cancer. The issue is what you do with it, how you can live your life the healthiest um, to, in order to minimize the impact of it or the probability of it impacting you, and how, to, and how to live your life to the fullest even if you do get cancer. That's really huge. It's a disease, it's not a death, it's a disease, it's not a death sentence, and it's not the end of your life. Life goes on way past cancer. And if we can get rid of the fear, that is 95% of what, what I think is really wrong with uh, cancer today. And yes, your question? Yeah, I was just wondering, when you mentioned earlier about, you know, our immune system potentially we could have cancer, have a really bad cold, and that's what it was, but your body gets rid of it. Does the body get rid of it all, usually, or does there still a little bit in there sometimes? I will explain that in a minute. So, in terms of prevention, we really do need to understand how cancer occurs in order to prevent it. This is a really interesting paper by, um, oh gosh, oh, I can't even read the end. Hannah and Weinberg in 2000. And this describe and like I got this in my undergraduate biology degree. This is just fascinating for biology nerds. There are approximately seven steps that a, cell, that a normal healthy cell needs to get cancer. First of which, cells need ex signals externally from other parts of the body to tell them to grow. Cancer cells do that for themselves. They do not pay attention to what's going on outside of them. They are telling themselves to grow all the time. The body will also send signals um, you know, externally to cells to tell them to stop growing. Cancer cells ignore those. Apoptosis is a very interesting concept in biology. When a cell gets very damaged, it will destroy itself. It will commit cell suicide. Cancer cells do not do this, and we'll get into why in a minute. Cancer cells are immortal. If you take a, a skin scraping of humans and then put them in a petri dish, they will divide a certain number of times and then they'll stop. It's called the Hayflick limit. Cancer cells do not have this. Cancer cells have an enzyme turned on called telomerase, which makes them effectively immortal which makes you wonder, there's a number of people in the States who are giving themselves telomerase in order to be eternally youthful. I think that's a terrible idea because uh, literally you're taking seven steps to cancer and turning it to six. So if there's, for instance, a cancer cell that has six, of, or, has six or if there's a precancerous cell that is not immortal, but you know it's got all this other stuff, you just took a step away. You made the development of cancer easier in your body. You may still choose to do it, but I, you need to keep that in mind. Next is angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is when a, a cell mass gets uh, bigger than about a millimeter, oxygen is not going to get to the core, and um, so oxygen and nutrients aren't going to get to the core, so that they will start to you know, decompose. They will start to die because they can't breathe. Um, angiogenesis is the ability to trick other cells into forming new blood vessels into, the t into a tumor or something. Um, so they have the ability to grow locally, so basically to expand and to maybe even lose contact with the other cells around them. So cells have these little proteins that kind of link them up together, so it's like holding hands with each other, and when a cell loses its grip with other cells, it will often destroy itself. Cancer cells don't do that. And the ability to metastasize. Metastasize is very, very complex. Like a cell's literally breaking off and tumbling through the bloodstream a ton, and then it just finds itself somewhere and is able to expand and grow. Very complex metabolic process. And, yes? With all those cell qualities, but I mean, you have to get those cells from somewhere. How did the cell came into existence in the first place in the body? Oh, mutations. Each of these is a specific set of mutations. Things. Everything in this list is prevented by something, and you have to lose those preventions in order to, in order for a cell to do that. So a cell will just have to have an incredibly improbable series of events happen to it to do this. 
this series of events is promoted by a certain environment the cell's living in. And by addressing that environment, we can reduce this risk of these things happening incredibly. So, yeah. Mutations, and um, there's a certain can biochemistry of cancer, and we'll get into that. So, underneath, the underlying those, those several mutations, there's underlying metabolic processes that give rise to an environment in which that can occur. First of which is the loss of ability to repair genetic errors. Genetic errors occur in our cells all the time, very, very commonly. Our cells have the ability to regenerate from them. Loss of the ability to do that is very common in, in cancer patients, either through genetic means or, through, um, or just through um, nutrient depletions. Loss of immune surveillance is another one. Even when your cells become fully cancerous, quite often the immune system will just like, hey, you look kind of weird. Come here. For, it's like getting pulled over in a traffic stop or something like, hey, you're, you're acting kind of funny. Come here. And then the immune system will destroy them. If you lose that, that's a big step. Um, one of the most incredible and most interesting ones is loss of oxidative phosphorylation. So it's a big word, but don't worry about it. O we'll explain it. But oxidative phosphorylation is the metabolic process in your body that uses oxygen to make energy. Cancer cells cannot do that. Generally, large. By and large, they can't do that. We'll go into more detail on that in a little bit. But um, yeah, that's really huge. And second of all is loss of ability to regulate the external cellular environment. When the cellular environment is terrible, mutations more frequently occur. Cells can't regulate themselves properly, and terrible things happen. But, and this is the wonderful part, None of those external, none of those factors that you know lead to the metabolic environment in which cancer occurs are set in stone. Every single one of them can be addressed, every last one. And when we do that, we can dramatically reduce, in my opinion, the incidence of cancer. Naturopathic medicine is just beginning to collect data on this, but it's well, it's just wonderful what we're doing so far. So I'm very optimistic as our stats compile as we mature as a profession. I mean, really, I would just love to see a study in which you did all this to someone and you followed them for like 60 years. You followed this group of people for like 60 years and saw what cancers occurred and what did not. Are different kinds of cancers shifted around? Do people, are more people predisposed to one kind of cancer versus not when all this is happening? Is it just across the board cancers are, are decreased? It's, I'm really optimistic about things like that compared with you know, people who don't um, go to naturopathic doctors and don't get these factors addressed. That is the, and that is, in fact, the big problem with what's going on now. So naturopathic medicine, very, very limited in terms of research, uh, research funding. Um, in my fantasy world, there are faculties of naturopathic medicine with naturopathic doctors slash PhDs evaluating things like this over decades with lots of research funding behind them because you know, we as a profession don't have enough money to do that. It costs quite a lot of money to follow people around for 50 years. So this is, my this is what I hope will happen one day. We've got a lot of ad, ad studies and a lot of practical things happening. Like if you alter someone with cancer's nutritional patterns and their cancer improves, it's pretty safe to say that it's gonna prevent, that same thing will prevent cancer as well. So, but that is unfortunately the limitation of this approach is that long-term long longitudinal and comparative data is lacking because of the limited resources of the, naturopath of the naturopathic profession. If any of you have, have political connections, please do tell, please do go and talk to your MLA or whoever and anyone else who will listen and tell them this deserves more research funding because it absolutely does. So, topic number one, methylation. Methylation, methylation, methylation. I will make your eyes glaze over and just talking about this for two minutes. It is really bloody complex. Um, <laughs> naturopathic doctors are the people with methylation right now. A couple of psychiatrists are starting to do it as well, but it's a very, very fascinating topic. Um, in short, your body takes methyl groups. So, you, I mean, you guys do a lot of work with natural gas and, and so forth. You know methane? Mm -hmm. Methane. Methane, you take off a hydrogen and attach it to something else, is a methyl group. It's a very simple molecule that our body uses to turn both to detoxify a number of things as a cell signaling molecule and to turn on and off DNA. Lose the ability to do this, terrible things happen. Not terrible things. Terrible things happen. 
These can be, your methylation status can be evaluated both on your blood biochemistry, so lab tests, and through genetics. Um, there's a company called 23andMe, which uh, it was a big thing in the news about a year ago. Does anyone remember that? So 23, it's, you spit into a tube, they will give you a readout of 900,000 of your single nucleotide polymorphisms. They used to give you a, they used to give you a readout of your risks as they decided on them. Those risks were speculative, um, so they stopped doing that, and that's what the FDA came after them for. They can still give you the data, and now they operate an ancestry. They they operate an ans, um, they operate an ancestry a service as well. So they give you the raw data and ancestry, which is very fa fascinating. Found out I'm 0.3 percent black. And I knew that anyway, but now I know the exact percentage. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I charge about two, and then you take that raw data, you bring it to a website called MTHFR support, which is methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase support, not the swear word support, but methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase support, and they give you a report on all your genomes. And then you need some, usually, some people can interpret them themselves with multiple days of effort. I could do it in about 20 minutes. Um, I charge $210 or $210 including GST for this and then we use that data to correct your methylation issues. So, there's methylation. I told you so. I told you, no, see, this, see, this, is, this is why I've never had anyone like, I tell them about it and then I show them what's involved in it. I'm like, okay, Paul, you do it for me. Um, so, this is the methylation pathways. Each of these little colored boxes are genes and this is this is why I can give you a presentation thing, or I can give you the whole presentation because this is copyrighted. So um, each of these is a gene. And so basically you get a readout on, oh, your catecholamine methyl transferase doesn't work, or this is the big one here, MTHFR, so methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. There's two mutations that are present in about 40% of the population um, called MTHFR667 or C667T, and one, it's either one, two, or one, six, three, eight, um, that are both very correlated with this not working. So each of these, each of these things depicts um, biochemical cycles, and they cycle them up, like they cycle methyl groups, and they cycle other things. Um, so you need each of them working in order for this to work properly. So let's say this one right in the middle comes up, the rest of them are gone. The rest of them don't work. So what you do with this is, see I've got another slide here. Once we figure out which mutations you have, and we may look at your biochemistry to figure out you know, how it's playing out, um, we can do very selective uh, uh, supplementation to make sure that the chemical, the chemicals, chemical or chemicals that you can't make are now in your system. So it means you have the biochemistry of someone who's, op who's got a perfect genome. That is huge. How have any of you heard about orthomolecular medicine? So orthomolecular medicine is uh, it's a movement mostly in psychiatry um, by Linus Pauling and Abraham Hoffer, or Abram Hoffer. Um, so they were using nutrients, particularly B vitamins. And if you like, there's a good website called orthomolecularmedicine.com or orthomolecular.com, one of the two. And they have they would give B vitamins to people. The trouble was some people it would work for some people and some people it wouldn't work. So this work is the continuation of that. They had to do it by trial and error. We can do a genetic analysis. So I'll give you one case study. That lightning bolt means it's the best thing I could do for mutation. So one of my patients was a 29-year-old man with very, very violent autism. Like he would hit and punch all the support workers and everything multiple times. He was very erratic and quite unstable. Um, really sweet guy, but so I did, a, I did this gen, genomic analysis on him, and he was heterozygous, so he had only one bad copy of MTHFR. So I'm like, oh, what am I going to do with that? So I did that, for, I did MTHFR for him, I put him on methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is the chemical that, um, that uh, Gene makes, I put him on like one milligram a day, and finally it's gone within, a, within two or three days. I'm doing other stuff with him as well, but that was really, really, really excellent. I'm doing it for a number of healthy people as well, and when healthy people take and do the program, you know, MTHFR is not, or MTHF is not the only thing we do, but usually people just notice, you know, I feel awesome, I feel healthy again, yeah. 
that kind of thing happens. So so much so that I've actually had to tell most people to take their, the vitamins that I give them for this in the morning because otherwise they're up all night. So, <laughs> yes. So this can help with autism as well? Yes. Yeah. There's a couple of things I do with autism. Autism, well, it's a separate topic, but this is often an issue with autism. And as well, quite often there's toxic injuries. And usually patients can trace it back or pa their parents can trace it back to a specific thing. Like, you know, some uh, sometimes it was, um, it was a drug that the child was given or a particular illness or um, a particular toxic exposure. And then they just really notice like <coughs> afterwards. Um, so I'm trained in cease therapy, which is about getting rid of those specific things and like helping the body clear that out of itself, even decades later. Yeah, so that is what, and so I do a lot, I'm starting to do more and more work with autism. So that's, I don't, it's funny, I checked the website. There is one certified cease practitioner in all of Alberta, and that's me. So, which is very nice. So, next topic, immune surveillance. Immunity is, pro in addition to the biochemistry of the body, is probably the biggest thing in cancer prevention. It's estimated, and I don't even know where they came up with this number from, and I'm guessing they probably just plucked it out of thin air, but that's okay. Um, it's estimated that the average person develops six or seven cancers in their lifetime, and it's just one that doesn't. That really makes it past the immune system. So overall, and that's only in that 41 or 46% of people who do get cancer. So you know what, that's pretty good. <laughs> like if our immune system has got that kind of a batting average, you know, if that was a professional ball player or something, you know, everyone would be after them. That's really good. So the question is, why does it fail in that one cancer? Yes? So that you get certain type of cancers and be destroyed by your immune system. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's probably the future of cancer therapy is whatever is stopping the immune system from destroying cancer, dealing with that. And then occasionally if cancer is already there, like kind of supercharging the immune system to go after it. We'll talk about that more later. So yes, absolutely, 100%. You are correct. I think, and... Historically, hunter-gatherers, you can find the odd hunter-gatherer with, with cancer. And hunter-gatherers, like, we have this impression that they lived horrible lives. If you're a hunter-gatherer and you're in contact with, you know, an advanced civilization, you have a terrible life. Historically, that is incredibly true. There's diseases, there's political oppression, there's, you know, environmental loss, there's, you know, things like ethnic warfare and so forth. But if you're a hunter-gatherer on your own, your life was actually quite good. <laughs> A number of hunter-gatherers lived to quite advanced ages. The big thing that was affecting them was injuries, like you know, if you got stomped on by, by some sort of an animal, or the very rare zoonosis, so a very rare, quite fatal um, like, uh, animal, like disease transmitted, transmitted from animals to humans, which did not affect people that much. If we look at hunter-gatherer skeletons, very, very few had cancer. Very, very few. So it's, it's quite remarkable to find one, actually. The earlier cancers, we find are actually in um, agrarian civilizations that had like traditions of metalworking, like Egypt and so forth. So I do not think humans should get cancer in a healthy environment. I just don't. All that ideological, maybe because I'm taking revenge on cancer after dad's death, but I think that's true and supported by the data. So our immune system usually destroys cancers and prevents them from ever becoming detectable. The issue, so if the immune system is doing that, we need to figure out why it stops at certain points in people's lifetime. These are the three that I've come up with some so far. Maybe later in life I'll come up with more, but these are the big ones right now. Chronic inflammation, diet, and this very interesting concept that used to be in allopathic medicine, but then they dropped it, and is still quite common in um, naturopathic medicine in Germany and in a fair amount of allopathic medicine in um, Europe the foci, the focal infection. It's a beautiful concept, I love it. So, chronic inflammation. I think most of you are very familiar with this because our culture is actually starting to address this. Um, chronic inflammation usually equals chronic pain, equals injury, equals musculoskeletal things, or immune issues, like chronic ulcerative colitis, or chronic Crohn's, or something. This is 
it's best worked out by good naturopathic and good physical therapies, such as, here are the big ones I really like, osteopathic. Osteopathic medicine is very difficult to get in North America in general. There are osteopathic doctors that are quite commonly trained in the United States. They're basically allopathic doctors who take a lead course in you know, physical medicine at this point. They're not great. Um, there are osteopathic practitioners, which are in Calgary. We are so lucky. There's a clinic on 17th Avenue, and they used to be called the English Osteopaths, but they had to change their name for some legal reason, because there's one osteopathic doctor in Alberta who objected to them using that and technically could do that. So you can just Google the English Osteopaths, and it'll take you to their new website and their new clinic. Very excellent. I love their musculoskeletal therapy. Massage and chiropractic. I, you know, Optimal Wellness, the clinic I, I work with, has 20 locations throughout the city. Almost all of them have massage and chiropractic. It's well known, it's a well, good part of our culture, and it can really help decrease this chronic inflammation that we're dealing with. And Bowen work. Bowen is an excellent therapy, again, for musculoskeletal things. Um, it's, basic, it's a type of massage where you're stretching muscles a little bit. Um, I took a course in it, and I really suck. But like, there's some things, you know, you just, like, there are some points in your life where you just have to say, like, I suck at this. <laughs> uh, but I can still do it to people, and I get incredible results despite sucking. So I'm like, I have no idea what someone who's good at this can accomplish. So I, I refer for that. So chronic inflammation, easy to address. Diet. Dietary generated inflammation is, I think, the big one. Did any of you go to my uh, presentation that I gave here in September about diet and gluten and so forth? It's on YouTube. So again, if you go on YouTube and you look up Paul Terrio Naturopathic, it will come up. And so my entire presentation in PowerPoint is there, and you can learn all about diet and some very easy things that anyone can do. The gold standard for getting a person on a good diet for them is an elimination diet. If you put them on a hypoallergenic, absolutely miserable diet for two weeks, maybe three weeks if their, their, digestive, their digestion is quite poor, and reintroduce foods one by one. That is the gold standard. There are other ways you can do it, like lab tests and so forth that aren't as accurate, but if you're generally healthy, usually people can cut out a couple of things like sugar and gluten and certain other nasty foods, and usually that's good for most people. And not cut out completely, like, you know, cut out 80 to 90% of the time and you're fine. So that's a big thing. So, other big issues, sugar. Sugar is the bloody devil. And chronic food intolerances, and we'll talk about that. So, sugar. In lab work and research work, sugar does tend to be associated with decreased immunity. Which is really funny, because like whenever we get sick, we, or children get sick, we feed them lollies and jellies and things like that. And uh, that's the worst possible thing you can do. It just shuts off the immune system right away. Uh, so, and doing so, chronic exposure tends to decrease the ability of the immune system to function. Like, let's say you go to Timmy's and get a double-double, and then you have another coffee, or maybe a donut at lunch, and then you have dessert with dinner. Sugar shuts off your immune system for about five hours, four to three, four or five hours. Um, so basically, if you do that, you're getting a regular dose of sugar. And let's be optimistic, and let's say you have breakfast at 7, shuts it off for three hours. Breakfast or lunch at 12, shuts it off for three hours. And dinner at 7, shuts it off for three hours. So you've basically, like, got all of your... <laughs> you've basically got this huge portion of the day where your immune system is just not working. So sugar. Sugar is for special occasions. If I could beat one thing into people, sugar is for special occasions. You do not have it on a daily basis. Okay? So you have sugar in everything you eat. Like it, does not, it does not. No, it, white sugar is oh, the problem. Okay. Seems to be the problem. Okay. Things like sugar? fruit do not. Uh, brown sugar is white. They, you know what they do? Brown sugar is theoretically better. You know how they make brown sugar? They take white sugar and put molasses in it. <laughs> so brown sugar is not any different unless you get a really high-end brand. So things like honey and maple syrup, tend not, this tends not to be an issue. So when you define sugar here, you were talking white, white sugar. Okay. White sugar. Processed. Things like fruit tend not to do this. Fruit is fine. but And it's one that is funny. It's like there's a really good homeopathic remedy made out of sugar. It's called Saccharum officinalis. And the picture of it, and I give it a lot, is people who just 
do not feel loved. It's like, I don't have enough love in my life, and they tend to eat and consume sugar in order to get that source of affection for themselves. <laughs> it's a fabulous homeopathic remedy for that. I've had given it to people, and they fainted. And then they're like, I don't want to eat. And then they wake, like, this happens all the time. I give people a homeopathic remedy, and they'll, like, take a five-minute nap in my office. And, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, you can take a nap. And um, then they wake up, like, I don't want to eat sugar anymore. That's the big thing with sugar is sugar is quite related to those feelings of love and companionship, and it does that in our brains, and so that's kind of the attraction of it in the culture. But it's white sugar. White sugar in the product, like chocolate bars and all yeah. That. yeah, yeah, white sugar. Things like maple syrup and honey, in reasonable amounts, tend not to do this. So okay, there's a ton of questions. You're the first. Um, that's the, what I was actually going to ask. Yeah. So, a little bit like it's funny one of my favorite things is kombucha and kombucha is tea plus sugar fermented the fermentation gets rid of the sugar there is there are you know there is sucrose in things like fruit and so forth there's it's the same chemical but there's other stuff there too so it's not a hard and fast rule it's generally if it's sweet it's probably too much from from white sugar it's probably too much if you're putting like a teaspoon of sugar, if you're putting like a teaspoon of sugar in a stir fry for, you're making for like five or six people, and there's like pounds of vegetables and stuff, like it's not so going to do anything. Like stevia, and stevia is not sugar. Stevia is cheating. It's wonderful. Stevia is a chemical, is like an amino acid, I think, that fools our body into thinking it's sweet. Stevia does not count as sugar. Stevia does not. Stevia, I haven't done huge amounts of research on it. It may have other issues, but stevia does not count as sugar. Yes, I know in your previous presentation, mm -hmm. agave, you did recommend agave. Agave, oh yeah. So you know high fructose corn syrup? You know the problem with it, because our bodies just don't like dealing with fructose? So high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose, and that seems to be causing that, because you know, normal glucose, normal sugar, which is bad enough, but normal sugar in fruit is 50% glucose, 50% fructose. Agave is 70% fructose, so it, you know, you know, just not not good. Yes? Is there any need for sugar in the body? There is a need for sugar, but um, sugar in the form of glucose can be obtained from many things that aren't actually sugar. It's not like you have an RDA of white sugar every day. Um, so things like carbohydrates are absolutely essential in the body. Carbohydrates are basically sugar smushed together. Um, chemically bonded. So there's a, there's a need for that. But in terms of like actual sugar, no. There's no there's no amount that humans require to live. As, as, a, as a sugar? Yeah. As white processed sugar. Okay. No need for it, nutritionally. So if I drink coffee with one spoon of sugar every day, like a cup of coffee, how bad for my sugar? It turns off your immune system for a while. Even with more sugar? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so that is the big thing with sugar. If I could have one, if that is one message I'd beat into you is that sugar is for special occasions. You know, if you have, if you get rid of sugar in most of your diet and then you have a birthday cake on the weekend or you have a, you know, you have a, my, my thing, sometimes I'll go out and I will gasp, have a Bellini. And that's fine. Really, like, or it's not about getting rid of it all, it's about getting rid of 90% of it in your normal diet. And then when you have a treat, that's not going to hurt you. How much we should take in a, on a daily basis? What is the on a daily basis? How we get Zero. <laughs> Zero on a daily basis. On a special occasion basis, you know, don't worry about it. How is like a good sugar, like a fruit stuff or some other... Oh, fruit sugar. is different. You know, fruit, you know, fruit, you know, multiple servings of fruit in a day, if you've got good blood sugar control, is fine. Fruit does not count as sugar. What about the juice if they say, like, uh, it's a... Juice, juice counts as sugar. Juice. So Sorry? basically, we're reading the labels. When the, when the mm -hmm. labels says sugar, and that's yeah, the sugar, sugar that we're talking about. Yeah, sugar-free. Sugar, uh, just the way with juice is juice contains enough... Like, juice, for some reason, seems to count as sugar in our body just because our bodies just don't seem to be adapted to deal with, like, fruit juices that much. Even when it says sugar-free? Even when it says sugar-free. Yeah. So wine, is that sugar? Alcohol does kind of count as sugar, but that depends on how much you have. Like if you're having like a glass of wine at night, you know, 
no, no problem. But if you're, you know, drinking a Mickey of hard vodka every day, yeah, that counts as sugar. So a glass of wine, you know, don't worry about it. It does metabolize to something like sugar, but it's not, it's not huge. Especially, and wine has correlated so well with, actually, no, we did a, we did a lecture on this. Wine and beer actually correlate with longer lifespans and decreased mitochondrial damage. I don't know if it's because of stress. Hard liquor does not. Wine and beer do. Wine do. Wine probably because of the resveratrol. Beer because of we don't know why. Hard liquor does not. No, it's true. It's like let's admit this. We, the beer does this, and we have no clue why. Maybe one day we'll find out. But right now. That's lactose, a different kind of sugar. Does not seem to do the same thing. Milk gives many people issues for other reasons, but does not seem to destroy your immune system quite in the same way white sugar does. So we're not against sugars, or in terms of carbohydrates, we're, it's the white sugar. It's the processed sugar. That is the issue. Yes, you in the back. So, is there any of that to, to kind of diagnose uh, for the food Allergy? Yes. There's lots of labs. I don't like them. Um, so all the labs currently diagnose, and I will get into this in a minute. Actually, no, wait, I, I've got the slide on this. So as well, sugar seems to de be associated with decreased immunity as well. Cancer cells lack mitochondria. Mitochondria, okay. mitochondria turn, so our bodies have metabolize sugar in two ways. They split it and get some energy from the splitting and then they put the split parts into mitochondria, and the mitochondria give the majority of the body's um, energy out of sugar. Cancer cells don't have mitochondria. So they just split the sugar and then chuck it out in the form of lactate. De depriving the body of sugar then decreases the cancer cell's ability to metabolize anything. So that is one of the more effective ways of like killing cancer cells, is just no sugar, no carbohydrates whatsoever. The cancer cells starve to death. Chocolate considered sugar? Yeah, yeah uh, most chocolate has sugar in it. And if you go with dark chocolate. If you have dark chocolate without sugar, or baker's chocolate, that doesn't count. Or just cocoa powder, that doesn't count. Yes. I don't know what's going on in those snack bars, but. <laughs> yes. If there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, an, uh, an MD homeopath in Holland who taught you um, taught my teacher one of my teachers Kim Kalina and he did this his name is Tynus Smits and he did this excellent picture of sugar saccharum officinalis as a homeopathic remedy when we find out what sugar does to people we it, you really start wondering about our society like sugar is that substitute for that love and that affection and that unconditional positive regard the fact is that we're all addicted to it and it's in everything. What does that say about us as a society? <laughs> Think about that. Yes? Yeah, you said uh, sugar affects your immunity. Is, it seems to be in the short term. Any long term effects? Probably. But there's no study you've done, right? Oh, I'm sure there are. I just don't know about them. So, so I guess in the short term, though, it gives a chance for the cells to mutate. Cells to mutate and just normal stuff like your body's fighting a virus and you shut it off, you shut off the immune system for four hours or bacteria, what's gonna happen? Bacteria is gonna get a chance to come back. All right, so this is uh, reflecting your question. There are two, all right, I don't have a slide on it, but there are two, there are two, three kind of ways to diagnose dietary intolerances. I'll talk about yours first. The big one nowadays, it's very popular with naturopathic doctors and I don't really like, is, the, uh, is blood immunoglobulins. So they'll test your blood for antibodies to things like, you know, a number of common foods. It's a, you know, it's a lab test. It costs between 100 to $500. And I don't particularly like it because you need to do it repeatedly over time because these, the antibodies present in your blood change. And quite frequently, it's dependent on exposure. So if you haven't eaten that food, the antibody's not gonna show up. And it's a function of intestinal permeability. So if your intestines are inflamed and lots of food proteins are getting through, your body's going to react to them and have antibodies to them. No question. Whether you've got whether you're truly reactive to that um, to that food in question is is 
you know, up in the air. So I, I tend not to do those unless everything else I've tried has failed. Most people can get rid of, like, you know, get rid of, like, raw milk rather than ferment, like, fermented milk like yogurt and kefir tends not to bug people. They get rid of raw milk, wheat, and sugar, and maybe a couple of the nastier pro and, like, most processed food, and they're fine. So if you've got more um, prominent digest, like, 90% of the people I see, I do that for them, and that is the issue. A second method, which I tend to favor, and I'm modifying it because I don't like the way it's done now, but I'm, I'm you know, just because maybe I'm arrogant and I think I can do it better, um, is the Carroll Food Intolerance Test. So Carroll Food Intolerance Test has been used for about 100 years, and it gets very good clinical results. Um, that's why I tend to favor it. Um, it's, the food groups are a little odd, so I'm altering them. Um, I'm still in the way, process of doing that but it has the longest track record of any food intolerance procedure and you get really good results with it. So it's been used since the 1930s. So that's why I favor it. Historical use and good results very consistently throughout that period. Um, and it's in office and it's free. So that's why I tend to favor it. You get the results like. The elimination of the God standard. The elimination diet is the gold standard. Um, for this, and I described it a little bit before. Put someone on a really restrictive diet for two or three weeks, reintroduce foods one by one. That is the best one. That is the gold standard of, of dietary stuff. So basically, if you reintroduce, for instance, I don't know, tomatoes, and all of a sudden you get digestive upsets after, after that, tomatoes are not a good thing for you. Eventually, people, when they figure out their diets and their digestive system heals, quite often they'll be able to eat a little bit of their food intolerance when their digestive system is better. Like, I can eat wheat now without, like, looking like I'm pregnant. Um, if I eat too much, I start to do that. I start to swell up again. But at this point, my digestive system is healthy enough that I do not react terribly that way. So eventually it gets better. But this has a problem. I, I, I tend to just take people off wheat and sugar and milk and replace them with other things that are, taste exactly the same and are easy to do. And that works for most people. The elimination diet tends, in my opinion, to be for people who are a bit more delicate and have a bit more extensive pathology. All right. Any questions on that? You guys are smart. Um, so foci are a very fascinating thing, and they have a very long historical, um, historical, what's the word? They have a very long history. Um, in the history of Western medicine. It's like not Western medicine in terms of allopathic medicine, but Western medicine in terms of holistic medicine and in terms of allopathic medicine. Benjamin Rush, who's like the archetypical allopath, he's you know one of the founders of the American Republic and signed the Declaration of Independence, um, also wasn't a great physician. I think after treating George Washington on his deathbed, George Washington told him to go, what is it, protested that Dr. Rush go away and that he be permitted to die uninterrupted after being purged and bleached and leached numbers of times. But he treated focal infections. When people came to him with chronic problems, he would often remove a diseased tooth and the chronic problems would go away. So chronic, so that, and it was um, fallen out of favor in allopathic medicine, but it's quite prominent in naturopathic medicine now and in German biological medicine and biological dentistry. So um, it's defined as a chronic infection or a chronic scar tissue, one of the two, that the body can't clear on its own. It's something that throws the entire body off. And it's very difficult to diagnose because it can be anything anywhere. And it's not a pathological lesion, it's a functional one. So if you, if someone dies with a focal infection, you can't like slice them open and put it on a microscopic slide and say, there's a focal infection, most of the time. So it's quite difficult to figure out that someone has a focal infection and what to do about it. It's it's quite challenging to diagnose these things without a lot of training, which I have. Uh -oh. So these chronic infections usually, and the, the really nasty part about them is that they're usually locally at the actual infection or scar site, asymptomatic. Nothing happens. Elsewhere in the body, things happen. One of the big, one of the more popularly accepted um, focal infections is dental work. 
You're all hearing about how having poor dental health correlates to heart disease now? That's it. It also correlates to things like cancer and autoimmunity and mental illness and a number of other stuff. But heart disease is definitely in there too. And local symptoms? Not much. They act, they create lots of local inflammation or they act as tiny hives of bacteria and infection, sending out little pulses of bacteria whenever your immune system has a low moment, like with sugar, for instance. The common one, or stress, or you've got an infection of another kind in the immune system's you know, dealing with that. The most common ones are teeth and root canals. I had one patient, like root canals, naturopaths, Naturopathic doctors generally just, you know, if you've got root canals, will probably send you to the biological dentist. So I wish Ling was here. Ling was, um, Ling was asking me all the time about the name of the biological dentist. I finally memorized it. It's Evans Dentistry in Market Mall. That is the biological dentist in Calgary. Um, so whenever I have someone who I want them to get their teeth addressed, I'll send them to him. Um, sometimes our body's capable of dealing with a focus. Sometimes their bodies can handle them if they're in otherwise good health. Sometimes I'll, you know, map somebody's focal, focal infections out, and you know they're at a certain level of severity. And when we address all their problems, they're much less severe. Sometimes they completely disappear. It's wonderful. So yeah, digestive inflammation is another one. So bacteria in your digestive system. That's I can I can deal with that myself. Tonsils. Tonsil scars. If you've got had your tonsils removed, can actually be worse than the tonsils themselves. And sinuses are another big one. So tonsil scars require a specialized therapy called neural therapy. I currently refer for that. I'm going to take the training sometime this year so I can do that. Usually with tonsil scars, it's an injection procedure to just inject directly into the tonsil scar area for a couple of times. And then that seems to reset the body's immune response so, and, uh, so that it can deal with that. Oh, actually, I have that problem myself. Um, the big thing with tonsil scars is they're usually associated with strep and a condition called pedia or PANDAS, or Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcus. And so I actually had this, and I just thought I was a weirdo, and that I went through periods where I just did not want to do anything, and then I um, got my tonsils injected, and that, there, I have other issues, but you know, that largely dissipated, so, and it dissipated in a very funny way. I remember getting it done, and then having like, having like these giggle fits for like, days afterwards, like, and it was really funny. I got it done during a course as a demonstration because, you know, I don't, I, I don't freak out easily and having someone put a needle in your mouth is quite freaky. And then um, afterwards, for the rest of the day, I was just giggling for, I giggled for like 30 minutes nonstop, even at serious things, which is very embarrassing. And then other reactions happen and then, you know, just, wow, I feel and I'm perceiving things really differently now. Wow. So, um, yeah, no, it's a very interesting procedure. And last of all, sinuses, which chronic sin and chronic sinusitis is the one which tends overwhelmingly to be fungal. You mentioned the root canals. Are you, are you meaning like you, you find something in someone that's had root canals? Yes, you almost them? universally. I had one, I had a friend, if she wasn't a patient, she was a friend. She got cancer herself in the middle of naturopathic college, which was, I felt so bad for her. And then she, she, healed herself of it. She did really well. She did chemo, did a lot of naturopathic stuff. And she's doing great now. She's, you know, one of those long-term survivors. And um, she took a remedy towards the end of her school, and it was silica. And silica as a homeopathic tends to, if you're healthy, it will tend to pop things out. Like you'll see people who have tubercules in their lungs, like little calcified things of tuberculosis. They'll start working themselves out between the ribs. And um, you'll see people with implants and so forth sometimes getting rid of their implants. And so she took this remedy and lost three teeth. Like, popped out. And I asked her, I was like, wow, that is weird. Did those teeth have root canals? Every single one, Paul. So they tend to be quite, um, they tend to be quite nasty for people. And some people can deal with them, some people can't. Um, yeah, so when that's an issue, I send people to the biological dentist and he helps them deal with it. I had sinusitis for the last, you know, couple of days. That's not a focal infection. It's acute, goes away. That's not a problem. Chronic sinusitis. People have sinusitis for months and months and months and years. That's what we're talking about. What about things like spring 
Those can act, the injuries and scars can also do that. If it's acute and it goes away and there's no problems, fine, no problem. If it's chronic and it continues to act up, that can also be a focal infection. I ran out of space on my slide. <laughs> there's a lot that could, it, it could be potentially anything, and yeah. So each of these will cause, may cause cancer in certain areas? Or they won't cause cancer in certain areas. They cause chronic inflammation increase your immunity, immunity. And, and send out little hives of bacteria that just tax your body. But, but that, I mean, like my question is, it may relate to any type of cancer? Yeah. Or it's, it's not like a specific one. That area. No, no, any type. It just decreases immunity, which increases your risk for every type of cancer. Uh, there's not the specific types, at least not that I'm aware of. I make no claims to know everything about this topic, but I'm not aware of any correlation that way. I remember, and I forget the exact numbers, but do you, anyone remember reading a couple years ago that there was a, there were a few studies done and they looked at breast cancer patients and how many had root canals versus how many didn't? 96% had root canals compared to a much lower number for the general population. Yeah. So, diagnosis of these is very actually tricky because of the lack of symptoms that are immediately apparent. For instance, one of the more common ones is called osteomyelitis. And osteomyelitis, if you have it in like any of the bones that aren't your jaw, you'll have a fever, you'll have septicemia, you'll have, you know, you'll know something's wrong with you. If you have osteomyelitis in your jaw, you know what symptoms there are? Nothing. Not nothing, but like very, very little. So they can be extraordinarily difficult to diagnose. And but once you get them, they're not that hard to treat. So there are particular procedures that I use based on reflex testing. So I'll poke you in a certain area, there'll be pain, or you'll have a change in your pulse or some sort of sign, and that will give us an indication of where a focal infection is and how severe it is. So I do this procedure quite well. I think there's a couple other people in Calgary who do it as well. And then we'll apply therapy. Usually these reflexes are located on the ear. Here's very, if anyone's ever studied auricular acupuncture, a particular French auricular acupuncture, so ear acupuncture, it's fascinating. Um, so what I end up doing with most of that is I, I will go and do auricular acupuncture or surgical referral to a biological dentist or, you know, neural therapy as indicated. And then we track, you know, how severe the focal infection is and it goes down as things go happen. It also goes down as people complete normal naturopathic therapy. As we get their diet in order and resolve whatever their immediate issues are, Get their and do hydrotherapy and get their vital force stimulated with hydrotherapy and homeopathic, um, their focal infections tend to become less severe. Quite often, the focal therapy is something I do for people towards the end if they're responding to therapy. And quite often, it, it's something I screen for initially and then we'll track it again at the end. And quite often, their numbers go down a lot and you know sometimes the, some of the focal infections even disappear. So that's really lovely. My treatment, ear acupuncture, which I mentioned, Dysbiotic therapy for, for folks side that tend to be in the digestive system. When you get the bacteria working, those go away. Those are really easy. Physical therapy, particularly if the fo focal thing is like a scar, as you mentioned, or like an injury, that's, and I refer for that. And neural therapy, which I refer for now, but I'm going to take that course myself. So, you need some advanced training in it. Um, so, any questions about that? How am I doing for time? Oh, okay, I'm doing, oh gosh, gotta move faster. Uh, immune regulatory therapies. So in addition to this, there are specific therapies that you can use that supercharge your immune system for a little while. The premier one is mistletoe. So it is an injectable preparation. Um, you need professional supervision to do this because like, first of all, the company is responsible and won't sell to like regular people who just want to inject themselves with mistletoe because some of them will die. Um, and not some of them will die because it's such a toxic therapy, but if you've got an allergy to this and you inject yourself with it and you don't have the equipment necessary or the training necessary to, to recognize if you're allergic to it, that's not gonna go well. So uh, it needs professional supervision. Originally it was used in Europe for cancer therapies and then we actually started discovering um, you know, someone who had cancer and who had ulcerative colitis and you know, did the therapy and like, hey, my ulcerative colitis is gone. Or they have rheumatoid arthritis and they cancer and they do the, the therapy. I'm like, hey, my rheumatoid arthritis is much better. 
So it doesn't, I don't think it acts on cancer specifically. I think it just supercharges your immune system and directs your immune system away from things like autoimmune diseases and allergies and stuff towards cancer. It, you know, it's like pushing the reset button on your immune system. Hey, I ca shouldn't be attacking my intestines. Hey, look, there's a cancer over there. Let's kill it. That kind of a thing. Other issues. So most humans have a lot of chronic immune issues in terms of chronic infections. A lot of chronic infections for which there are not vaccines currently are conventionally known. Things like hepatitis B. Uh, there is a vaccine for hepatitis B now, but hepatitis C, human papillomavirus that isn't covered by Gardasil, Helicobacter pylori, Epstein-Barr virus, and a number of others, these respond very well to naturopathic therapies. So if you can clear those, if we can get your immune system sufficient that it can clear all that crap out, much less chance of developing those, those things. Allopathic medicine is beginning to take notice of this in terms of their um, triple therapy, so using antibiotics to treat gastritis, which is the big thing with Helicobacter pylori. But um, I'm, it tends, in my experience, to be less than permanent. You do the helic, you do, there's a breath test for Helicobacter pylori. So, you know, someone gets the triple therapy and then they come back in and, you know, a couple months later, redo the breath test, still there. Mm. So my therapies tend to work a little bit more consistently. Maybe I just do better follow-up and so, and so forth, but, yeah. Another big topic, mitochondria. So any of you take biology in high school or university? So mitochondria are tiny little baby bacteria. They're ancient bacteria that our cells just incorporated themselves. They are energy generators. So our cells originally could break down glucose into pyruvate, and they would get two molecules of energy, or ATP, out of that. So that's two molecules per molecule of glucose. That's pretty good. Mitochondria make about 30. So you can see that that's obviously quite a big improvement. Um, they break down pyruvate into ATP, carbon dioxide, and water. But pyruvate um, is the breakdown product of glucose so the cell can make pyruvate itself. And when you make pyruvate, the eventual product that the cell excretes is lactate. We'll get into that in a minute. That's a mitochondria and that is, so you will get this picture because it's not copyrighted. Um, they have a bunch of, an outer and inner membrane. If any of you took biology, you'll remember a whole lot about oxidative phosphorylation. That's the, what the cell can do. It breaks down glucose at the top left there to pyruvate at the bottom right. And that's how the mitochondria does it. I'm not going to explain that to you because it's complicated. Mm -hmm. just glucose comes in, or pyruvate comes in, energy comes out along with carbon dioxide and water. That's what you need to know. Mitochondria create ATP and reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are the same thing as free radicals. So are about one to two percent normally of what our body, the oxygen our body breathes in becomes converted into reactive oxygen species. That's normal, that is not a bad thing. Our bodies are very, very well adapted to dealing with that. But in unhealthy people, that could be five to 10%. That, whether it's one to two percent or five to 10% is extraordinarily dependent on our nutritional status and our drug consumption. You know, one of the biggest things that kills uh, mitochondria NSAIDs, aspirin, acetaminophen, uh, nip, oh gosh, I can't even remember, remember the other ones, but a lot of those, kill, and a lot of allopathic drugs, kill mitochondria very, very effectively. Interestingly enough, mitochondria often also contain a lot of the proteins that the cell needs for um, apoptosis. So remember apoptosis, the cell is destroying itself because it's, you know, for the greater good because it's become messed up. Both of those proteins and mitochondria, their health is very nutritionally dependent. And the big interesting thing, but I have no idea why this isn't emphasized more in, in uh, allopathic oncology, is that almost to a T, cancer cells don't have mitochondria. When you don't have mitochondria, you can't turn pyruvate, you can't turn you know, lactate, pyruvate into ATP. You need a constant stream of glucose to prepare yourself, and apoptosis will not happen. Yeah. Ibuprofen is the same thing as the. Oh gosh, I'm having a drug thing. 
Yes, ibuprofen counts as well. Yes. Well, you know, if it's not, you know, taking one ibuprofen or an aspirin or something won't kill you, certainly. I mean, people take these long term without, you know, immediate long term effects, but they do affect the mitochondria. So it's just, again, you should not, I do not want to increase fear. Increasing fear is a terrible thing. This is what these products do. You may simply change your behavior now that you know what these products do. So you do not have to be afraid if you want to take an ibuprofen or an aspirin or something like that. You may choose to go another route and do something naturopathic in order to deal with whatever the problem is, which you know will not kill the mitochondria, but you just know now that is what these drugs do. But doctors say that aspirin should be taken daily on a daily basis for people who tend to have drugs in their blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The artery. The yeah. artery yeah. Yes, they do. So. Be risk benefit. I am not going to tell you that aspirin does. It, it would be really nice if you needed it. That aspirin didn't do these things, but it does. Risk benefit. Does the risk outweigh the benefit for you? For blood clots, blood clots are pretty severe. Yeah, that risk might outweigh the, or the benefit might outweigh the risk for that person. So, yeah, just because a drug does something nice doesn't mean it also doesn't do nasty things. <laughs> so. The interesting idea, we used to think of cancer as kind of a, an aberrant state. What cancer probably is now, I mean, think about it. It's a cell that's lost its mitochondria, and it's lost its ability to coordinate. That is not an advanced state or a mutational state. That is a cell regressing to a primitive state before cells learn to live together in harmony. The cells lose mitochondria. They lose their ability to regulate themselves for the common good. Cancer is not so much you know, a mutation as it is a regression to what animal cells were before we kind of, our cells learned how to live together in a greater whole. So cancer cells are very dependent on sugar in the bloodstream. And this is the appeal of ketogenic diets. So you've all heard of the Atkins diet? Ketogenic diet is the Atkins diet times a million. You're basically off almost all carbohydrates. Ketogenic diets are actually really good for things like epilepsy and some neurological conditions, but cancer cells, they basically tend to, it tends to start cancer to death. There is no cancer cells can't break down fat, which is what the keto, uh, fat and ketones, which is what you know happens in the ketogenic diet. So they starve to death. Excellent therapy for them. Last one, and this I could do like a I could do a whole seminar on this. Terrain regulation. So the terrain is basically the environment outside the cell. Since because of the wide impact of a physician called Birkow, who really put a lot of emphasis on cells and cellular pathology, we paid a lot of attention to the cell. But the cell is not the sum and total of biology. There's an environment outside of the cell that is extraordinarily refined and delicate and beautiful. Um, and can, in addition to be refined and delicate and beautiful, can be incredibly screwed up. Getting that environment in order is one of the key things to prevent all of those mutations that we talked about a long time ago. Uh, from occurring. Conditions of pH, the ability of the cells to get rid of toxicity, lymph, the ability to de get rid of metabolites. So cells need to get rid of their waste. If their extracellular matrix, if their terrain is not able to do that, it's like a human drowning in its own sewage. Like, how's that going to turn out? Cells need to get rid of their waste and they need to have in nutrients come in. You need this terrain to work. This is a concept almost completely absent in, in um, the public medical system right now. And it is a very long process. It involves regulating the diet, regulating the gut health, regulating what are called your amunctories, so the organs in your body that eliminate toxicity. And it's a very long process. The very common ones that people do are like, um, I'm not gonna name brands or anything, but like there's two week detoxes where on a terrible diet you take herbs. Um, it's going to take more than two weeks to clean this crap up. Um, I tend, when I do detoxification with people, it's part of my overall treatment with them. And it's for months. You get them on a good diet that they can actually live on and do months of detox with them and their body will slowly, by itself, remove toxins. Um, I also get them on a really good homeopathic remedy. I, I talk about homeopathy a lot. If you look on the internet, homeopathy has gotten a very bad rap nowadays. Um, 
sometimes I feel like Galileo. Like Galileo, after he decided that he told everyone that he thought the sun moved and then he was tried for heresy, he said, you know, everyone told him he was wrong and the sun, the sun did not move. And his final words were, you know, but it does move. And so that's kind of how I feel a lot of the time. I get all this stuff on the internet, you know, oh, Paul, homeopathy doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I'm like, but it works. So that's kind of my thing. I've, if anyone wants to talk to me about homeopathy, I've got, I've got stories that will make your teeth curl or your hair curl. But I, I find it actually really is an excellent, like with the mistletoe therapies, an excellent like kick in the butt for the body to re-regulate itself. It turns on everything that should be turned on, turns off what should be turned off. And in addition to that, people's mental emotional health just goes wonderfully and their body just lets go of toxins so more effectively. And everything else I do is so much more effective when a person is on a good remedy for them. There's also more manual techniques like steam rooms, saunas, and constitutional hydrotherapy, which I love. I think hydrotherapy is the best thing, and it's an underutilized naturopathic modality. Very few naturopathic doctors do it, but I love it. And it takes a lot of work on the patient's part, but it's cheap, and it's easy, and it makes you feel good. So most people, when I give them the talk a couple times, are quite willing to do it. Detox is not something you can accomplish in two weeks. You might do an intense period for a couple weeks, but it's not something you can do in two weeks, and it is very individualized. So it depends on where you are, how you detoxify, and your own particular exposures and issues. That is all I'm gonna say about that. So there are two topics that last time I gave this talk, uh, you know, a few months ago at a different, in a different area, I got asked a lot about cancer and um, some other things, or cancer and like, I got lost, asked a lot about pot. Every cancer talk, someone talk, mentions pot. Um, naturopathic doctors have a very interesting relationship to marijuana. I think for a little while, Health Canada was actually asking us to dispense medical marijuana, and uh, like they wanted us to be responsible for its dispensation, and we told them we didn't want to do that because that was a terrible idea. I mean, can you imagine if I had a, a storehouse of medicinal pot in my office, and then you know, that, oh my God, the insurance costs would be up. <laughs> so we didn't do that. I do have great respect for marijuana as medicine. Um, much of the literature concerning marijuana as medicine is by people who enjoy its non-medicinal use who are attempting to justify it um, to legislatures, legislators and so forth. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. But it does seem to have legitimate medical use. Cannabinoids are, so cannabinoids, the most famous, ex famous external cannabinoid that is in marijuana or cannabis sativa is tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. There's a class of chemicals inside our brains and inside our bodies that are analogous to those that are very similar. So that's why it has its effects. I quoted this paper at the bottom. They are involved in cognition, memory, anxiety, control of appetite, emesis, which is um, vomiting or nausea, motor behavior, sensory, autonomic, and neuroendocrine responses, immune responses, inflammation, both centrally in your central nervous system and peripherally. They do a lot. They, people do seem to be having success just in their own therapeutic experience taking um, uh, marijuana products for um, when they are having uh, cancer. The, I did some work, look, work looking at this, and it seems to be help. But in terms of lab studies, it does seem to prevent neoangiogenesis, so it does seem to prevent new blood cells forming for tumors. Probably does other things as well, but that's the, the big research hypothesis. Um, again, some of the people who are enjoy the non-medicinal, well, I think non-medicinal use of uh, marijuana products uh, tend to be focusing on how it prevents cancer. That it, it does seem to have some effect in mice studies, but that's not smoking that's uh, oral. Um, smoking does not seem to have the same clear data behind it. So it does not seem to prevent cancer, maybe because the smoke is just as damaging as the protective effect or they weigh each other out or anything. So there's no clear data there. But ingesting, maybe, might be better. So it, you know, just to make a joke, maybe instead of smoking, maybe you know, brownies are the solution without sugar um, are the solution to that thing. Um, without sugar and without gluten. So gluten-free, sugar-free brownies, maybe. I'm not endorsing that, but you know, it seems like a better idea to me. Um, it definitely helps with nausea with people who are undergoing advanced cancer and they can't keep anything down, it definitely helps with that. We have very good evidence that it does. And it does seem to make dying go easier for people. 
So just based on that, like for palliative care, I have no problem with marijuana. And naturopathic doctors, hopefully in Alberta, will be getting prescriptive rights in the next year or so. Marijuana may be on there, it may not be, I don't know. I, if I was dealing with cancer patients, and I'm not like active cancer patients right now, I, w I would not, you know, if I had prescriptive rights, I would not have a problem prescribing someone marijuana. I don't do that now, I want to be very clear. Um, but yeah, no, I would not have a problem with that just because it does seem to be very effective in the last stages of life. All the other stuff, that's the data I've, as I've been able to find it, so forth. I will leave you with a trituration note. So in homeopathic medicine, there's a process by which you make a medicine. You grind it, you scrape it with um, milk sugar. You take the actual substance, grind it, and scrape it with milk sugar. And quite often when people do this, like I've done this, I will experience the symptoms of that remedy that it can cure. Um, so this is actually a really good one from some uh, people who triturate um, in, um, do these quite frequently in British Columbia, in, Van in Victoria, actually. It's by a, a homeopath out there, not a naturopathic doctor, but a homeopath named Roland Gunther. In using cannabis as a drug, and this is kind of the picture they come, came up with when they're triturating uh, cannabis, people are stuck in the lower levels and the vision of the goal turns into an illusion, thus destroying the path itself. The practical walking of the spiritual path is replaced by the illusion of already having reached it. In that way, the goal will never be reached. The abuse of cannabis turns a teacher plant into a trap. The message that they got from you know cannabis, you know, the, the message that they got to fix this is bring the higher spiritual wisdom down into the physical reality. Get going, get to work. That is the message of cannabis as you know the solution to that problem. I'm sure all of you have known some people who do who do a lot of pot. Almost everyone has. It's a very good message for them, isn't it? That is the caution I always give people who who advocate for cannabis too much. That is the state of this as a rent. That is the state that cannabis tends to put people in, both in its crude use and um, and so forth. So this is something that needs to be held in held in um, held in. You know, you just need to know about this if that's what's going to happen with you. So I've been reading about this the last couple of days. Anyone read the news reports about um, this woman who was? I'm, I'm going to you know, use the little quotation marks. Cured of cancer after um, being injected with a measles vaccine. Oh, it's all over the news. It's all over the medical news. Um, first of all, cured. She was not cured. She has been in remission for a while, and there's two people this was done on. One is in remission after nine months, and one has had a recurrence that was treated with radiation. So, cured is a media headline. Um, it was, and the measles virus was genetically modified to attack the blood cells. I mean, measles normally kind of attacks blood cells, but it was modified to attack the blood cells of the specific blood cancer that these women had. So this is a very specific thing. So it's, there's a long, there's been talk about using viruses and cancer therapy since before I was an undergrad, um, you know, about 10 years ago. And they haven't really materialized. So there's this long tradition of sort of, you know, focusing on in the future, science will make everything better. Uh, I stopped buying that a while ago. <laughs> if it's like a propaganda thing, it's like, in the f oh, in the future, we'll solve all your problems. It's, it's a same utopian vision, whether it's the communist utopia or, you know, whether it's the communist utopia or, you know, the rapture or anything else, it's always you know, projecting onto the future when all of our problems will be solved magically through science or through whatever means, or through communism or through whatever means. It's kind of a tendency in human life to have that kind of millennial vision and, you know, forgive me, I don't think it's going to work that way. Um, they may, there may very well be therapeutic applications that emerge out of this eventually, however. But I found this actually very interesting. So there's a homeopathic remedy that's made out of like, um, I think a blood sample of someone who had, uh, who had measles called morbillinum. And there's a very excellent, because in, in Britain, there are medical doctors, so allopathically trained medical doctors who will often take homeopathic training and convert and become part of the faculty of homeopathy, which is a separately regulated profession in Britain. And they treat patients homeopathically or with drugs as they need it. They still have the ability to prescribe drugs. So there was one woman in, from the 1800s to the 1940s called Margaret Tyler who did this, and she wrote extensively on morbillinum. 
And she used it a lot of the time, especially in cancer patients who had never been well since measles. And she found when she, like there was a person who had never been well since measles and they would get cancer, she would give them a dose of that remedy and quite often that cancer would, begin, would become much more therapeutically responsive. responsive. She found that very much so. I found that to be a very fascinating parallel to this modern therapy. Admittedly, a homeopathic remedy is not the same thing as a vaccine, remotely. <coughs> but I just, I thought that was just so interesting. And in, in naturopathic and homeopathic medicine, we've known for a long time that if you, if you as a person have a very bad experience with a disease, quite often that same you know, sequelae, those same physiological consequences will be passed on to your offspring. Was that present in the history of these two women? I don't know. I, I mean, I have no idea who these women were. But I find that very interesting. So it may be that this is kind of a homeopathic insight into that. And wow, what a pretty noise. Uh, so, Thank you for choosing WestJet. Your last flight was selected among thousands of flyers. Okay. Receive $999 credit towards your next trip. Oh, WestJet. <laughs> They're doing that to me too. I love WestJet. But like, oh, WestJet, come on. I, you know, I don't want to take your survey, whatever. Anyway. I find that to be actually a very fascinating parallel with the current therapies. And unlike in allopathic medicine, you know, giving a homeopathic nosode is very inexpensive, and if it doesn't work, nothing happens. So I find that to be actually quite interesting. And I'm doing a lot of this kind of work with nosodes, not only the measles nosode, but with, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of work with people who have like Lyme disease now, and sometimes they're not responding to other therapies. A dose of the Lyme no so like, damn, it's wonderful. To the point where, again, I'll often give these people a dose of the Lyme no so and I'll give them a test dose in my office just to see what happens, and they'll just like, oh, wow, that, that tastes really good, even though it tastes like milk sugar. Like, objectively, it tastes like milk sugar. Like, that tastes really good. I feel good. I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> and then they fall asleep for five minutes and feel great. And then, you know, that's a, that's a good remedy for them. So, my own program based on all this data that we've talked about is we throw all of this together. I do give so lots of studies, not great ones, not on humans, on rats. So there are kinds of rats that are very genetically predisposed to cancer where every single rat in this lineage will get cancer. They'll give it to them after they develop cancer and those rats will not get cancer at the same rates. They also give it to rats before they get cancer, and they will give, and those rats develop cancer at lesser rates than the rats that don't get the treatment. So that's lovely. There, and it does seem to reduce in, in um, humans who get the treatment. It does seem to reduce development of secondary cancers afterwards. Data is not huge, but it's good. So it does seem to be relatively, relatively consistent. There is one study where there was not any difference detected but they were using part of a protein of this instead of the whole mistletoe extract. Why would they do that? Drug development. They were looking for a drug to develop that they could patent so they could make money off this. Mistletoe therapy is expensive. I think one round of it is a hundred and, and something bucks. Um, but in terms of how many of you know how much cancer therapies cost? Tens of thousands of dollars. It is dirt cheap compared to other ones. So they're looking for a drug they can patent, and they didn't find it, but they didn't use the whole plant extract. They used a, used a specific protein, likely with a mind on exploratory drug, back, um, drug exploration, and likely kind of trying to tilt people away from this therapy to prepare the market for a drug that they probably are developing right now. So that's my, that's my you know, forgive me for being conspiratorial. The program. With this program, uh, I do this program generally only with people who are in my naturopathic practice. We do the naturopathic thing for them. We help their terrain, detoxify them, get rid of foci. We do that genomic analysis, you know, the map, that the picture that gave you all the headache early on. We do that for them, get them on their specific supplementation. I'm probably going to add in uh, mitochondrial support during this, these little phases, and I'm probably going to add in a period of ketogenic fasting. So. Yeah, that's usually, so that's, you know, what's happening with that. 
I do not give this practice, this uh, program, outside to people who just want it periodically, because this, in my mind, is part of general naturopathic care. You need the you need the general like the foundation to be laid in order for this to be truly effective. How many of the so in terms of the part of general naturopathic care, just because I think it's better for everyone. You address multiple factors. You promote the health of that individual, physical and mental, emotional, and you address specific things. So that's why I do that. And of course, the genetic like the genetic analysis, you do that once. Your genome is pretty much set, so you don't need to do that more than once, and that becomes a very consistent thing. Focal therapies can take a while, but that's part of naturopathic care. So usually, with the fo the focal the foci that you know can resolve, I can resolve. I get them resolved in a, like a year or less of like fairly infrequent therapy, and then those that do need resolution, if they don't you know respond completely to therapies, I will often refer to that biological dentist or to you know someone who'll work out whatever scar tissue you have and so forth. So. And of course, individualized care. So that is my that is my program. That is my program. That is my presentation, and I am exactly on time. Yay for me! So, do you guys have any questions for me? Hi, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, both are actually quite good. So, many people say that reverse osmosis drains you of minerals. Uh, I haven't seen any long-term data either way. If you're worried about it draining you of minerals, you can always add more minerals in the supplementation. What was the question, sorry? Reverse osmosis versus filtered spring water. Both good choices, whichever you choose is your thing. Reverse osmosis, the big thing with reverse osmosis is often like it's one of the few things that gets fluoride out of the water if you're not into fluoride, and I'm, I'm not a public supporter of fluoride. It really does prevent cavities. It does do that. You know what else it does? According to the Harvard School of Public Health, it drops children's IQ points on average five points. It increases the rate of bone of osteoporosis and bone cancer and thyroid issues. I think that I think getting rid of all that stuff is worth a couple of cavities, personally. Um, so fluoride is the big thing, uh, but thanks to Minchi and uh, the council in 2010. Calgary does not fluoridate, flora, or 2011, I should say, Calgary doesn't fluoridate water anymore. So I use a, I use a, a gravity filter. Um, the brand I use, I don't make any money from them, it's called Santivia. So I use that brand of water filter. I, I like it. it you know, it's funny, after you get sensitive enough, you can kind of tell, like, I will drink tap water, and I'm like, okay, I'll drink the Santivia water. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so as I have not, and in terms of long-term data on water, there's, there's nothing. So... Yeah, so I use Centivia. Reverse osmosis is great if you're in a really polluted area, but Calgary's not. And if you're concerned about letting fluoride out of the water, but Calgary doesn't have any. So, yes? Is the visit to the naturopathic doctor covered by your private It is covered by your guys' mm -hmm. private benefits. If anyone has any kind of private benefits, about 95% do at least $500 coverage. Alberta Healthcare does not cover us yet. You can talk to your MLA about why that is. <laughs> yeah, we're currently focusing on most of our energy right now on getting uh, l getting some of our labs covered. Hope we're hoping to do that. I mean, we're in negotiation over that and getting prescriptive rights because a lot of vitamins and supplements and things right now are being reclassified as prescription drugs, and then you know we lose access to them, and we want we want to keep that as well. And there are some drugs that are legitimately good. So uh, we want to have prescribe them because we are licensed primary care providers. So we need to have access to all the substances we do for need for primary care. Is there anything further you can do besides talking to your MLA? You can add, you can talk to MLAs, advocate, talk to Alberta Healthcare. Like if you know anybody at Alberta Healthcare, talk to them. Like what this is exactly the way that Alberta Healthcare is advocating for the for healthcare to move. Why is this profession that does, that specializes exclusively in it being marginalized so effectively? Like, what? Why is this happening? It is not in the control of like Al the, Al the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Alberta. The College of Physicians and Surgeons in Alberta is extraordinarily supportive of us. It's to a certain extent individual people and bureaucracies that just aren't built to accommodate other professions. So, if you have any connections with healthcare at all, talk to them. Like, why is this not happening? 
it should be an option. Like I have people I treat who are low income and I basically treat them for free because they can't afford to pay me. And their choice of naturopathic medicine is not available to them. And I don't think that's right. They sh everyone should have every anyone should have the health care that they choose for themselves, yeah. regardless of their ability to pay. You should not and have means. Choices. Yeah, you should not have me have to have means in order to have yourself or your children treated naturopathically. You should not. So that is kind of my. Let me just get down off my soapbox. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Did you say that they're looking at um, looking at prescriptions and vitamins and minerals as being prescriptions? They're cla reclassifying them legally as prescription drugs in many cases. Yeah. Yes, it is. Sometimes, like, some natural products are extraordinarily dangerous. But other things, like, I don't see why the government feels the need to make 4,000 for instead of 1,000 IU of vitamin D a prescription drug. Yeah. That's Health Canada. Health Canada is extraordinarily good to us. And the Natural Health Products Director is actually, there's about 12 naturopaths, naturopathic doctors working there. Oh, so I will have your, your question before you go. Okay. Do you need a referral to go to the What? Do you need a referral from the No. Nope. You can make an appointment with any ND you choose. And if you're look, if you've got a specific question for me, I'll, I'll do like a 15 minute, like just free, you know. Talk, you can come and ask me afterwards.